Welcome to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where you can learn and be inspired by real-world examples of how technology is transforming businesses and reshaping industries in a language everyone can understand. Here is your host, Neil C. Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast. Now, there has been a lot of excitement around space exploration recently, and I have a fascination with satellite technology too, because I think we all take it for granted in our everyday life, whether it be predicting weather, handling navigation, communications, and TV broadcasting. These are just a few areas that transformed our world But like I said, we take it for granted. But today's guest was first exposed to active phased array antennas while designing satellites at Lockheed Martin back in the early 1990s. And at that time, engineers spent three to five years building a geostationary communication satellite that cost hundreds of millions of dollars to perform a specific job. And if that job was broadcasting television programming to the U.S., the satellite's fixed beams offered coverage in the shape of a US map. And high-end military satellites with active phased arrays were far more flexible. Operators could steer beams electronically, modify power levels and address changing demand, and even move a satellite to a different orbit to fulfil a new mission. Incredibly cool. But today's guest thought, but why aren't we building all communication satellites around active phased arrays. And the rest is history. And I'm talking about CCM Astro's CEO, Shay Sabripour. And as the insatiable demand for data in all forms, from imaging and telecom to video and AI and beyond, as all that grows exponentially, the infrastructure for transmission and processing of such data is evolving far beyond the confines of terrestrial network. But enough scene setting from me. It's an incredibly cool story, so buckle up and hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way to Texas so we can speak with Shay about CCM Astro, the story behind it, and so much more. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Oh, thank you, Neil. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, my name is Shay Sarripour, uh, and I'm the founder and CEO of Cesium Astro in uh, Austin, Texas. And Cesium Astro specializes in uh, software-defined communication and RF sensing payloads uh, using active phased array technology. We mainly focus on aerospace applications, uh, but other applications uh, such as high-performance ground systems as well as uh, future autonomous vehicle uh, systems uh, are also on our roadmap. And one of the things I always try and do on this Daily Tech podcast is also do a little bit of research and find out more about the very human story behind your your tech journey. And I mean, I had a quick look at your backstory. I believe you were first exposed to active phase array at and tenors while designing satellites at Lockheed Martin in the early 90s. But can you tell me more about your story and, and ultimately what, what it was that put you on this path that you're on today? Sure, sure, Neil. Um, yeah, I'm an electrical engineer and I, and I started uh, my career at Lockheed Martin Space Systems Company and initially working in the field of power electronics, uh, powering uh, you know, our payloads. Uh, these are RF payloads. Uh, you know, amplifiers and systems. And uh, yes, I was uh, introduced to phased arrays early on. And, but for some context, before we talk about phased arrays, uh, uh, you know, uh, traditional broadcast or fixed satellite services, you know, the ones that Sir Arthur C. Clarke wrote about in a seminal paper in 1945, where he can place three satellites uh, in a geostationary orbit about 36,000 kilometers above the equator. And uh, these kind of satellites were mainly fixed services, broadcast satellites. So for context, you know, uh, HBO or, uh, you know, other stations or, uh, uh, you know, content providers would, uh, would uplink the signal to the satellite and then the satellite with uh, would amplify the signal and send it back to Earth in a broad beam that typically covered, uh, let's say, continental US or parts of Europe. And these are fixed beam. And that for that purpose, uh, it was a nice, elegant solution, right? I mean, you uploaded the same content for everyone and, and you broadcast it to the entire nation. But, but I watched these payloads become more complex and more bespoke 
uh, for every mission uh, as the years went on. This was going on for decades. Uh, as, as people wanted, besides that uh, broadcast service, or wanted local news channels and they wanted to maybe uplink to request more uh, ad hoc services, uh, that kind of service, that kind of system just wasn't uh, quite applicable, uh, in my opinion. And I, and I just thought that uh, the time would come that we would have to use a different technology. And, and these broadcast uh, antennas, by the way, uh, use shape reflectors. You shape the reflector. It, if you look at it, it doesn't look like the dish on your on your roof where it's nice and uh, just a parabolic dish. Uh, these these antennas are shaped, and you, you, you would that you would if you looked at them, it would look like it has a bunch of ripples on them. And the reason for that is you were shaped the beam for a, a certain geographic footprint uh, of the satellite uh, beam. So, for example, if the satellite was designed for U.S. or designed for Europe, the beam would look like that part of the geography. But if um, you wanted to, let's say, the business plan changed or someone uh, ch uh, changed the usage of the satellite, you wanted to move it from uh, over Europe or Asia, you were stuck with this beam. And uh, so I was aware of this phased array technology that would allow you to reshape reshape the beam and um, and uh, you know put the power where the customers are and uh, steer the beams where the customers are and all this dynamics aspect of a phased array. Uh, would be really applicable to this kind of technology and provide a lot of flexibility to our customers. So that's, I became very passionate about this. I couldn't get it out of my mind, as, uh, as I say many times. I just literally couldn't get it out of my mind for, for decades, uh, for, for, for a long time. I did ultimately end up leading a group uh, at Lockheed, uh, uh, you know, building our first uh, commercial demo phase to ready for a mission. But ultimately, I decided that uh, I want to build a company around this. And uh, and commercialize this technology for all sorts of applications. So that that's sort of uh, the background story. Love that. What a great story. And something else I'd love to explore with you, as the insatiable demand for data in all forms, from imaging and telecoms to video, AI and beyond, as all that grows exponentially, the infrastructure for transmission and processing of such data is evolving beyond the confines of those terrestrial networks that we've been talking about. So can you tell me more about how you're tackling these problems right now? Yeah, uh, very true. Uh, you know, I'm not one to say that satellites uh, are the only way <laughs> for yeah. advanced telecommunication. I think uh, certainly other technologies uh, have had their place and they will always have their place. I think uh, cell towers are going to be around for, for a long time for, uh, you know, populated areas and uh, fiber optics uh, for for uh, lots of applications will continue to serve uh serve the market well, but uh, satellites have always traditionally, the reason for satellites is that they provide instant infrastructure around the world. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, you can uh, create a global uh, telecommunication system by launching uh, a, a number of satellites. So like I said, in the geostationary orbit, you can uh, do it actually within roughly with three or more satellites. Uh, it won't cover the entire globe, uh, but it, it, it covers the up to the latitudes that uh, are most populated and then in, of course in low earth orbit uh, you can cover the entire globe and it's and it, as i said it provides infrastructure in instant infrastructure globally where uh, you wouldn't typically make the investment of uh, running down the fiber optics cable or or uh, placing your cell towers in the very remote areas and uh, so satellites are very good for that and then especially as I mentioned, as, as the demand has gone from uh, fixed satellite services with antennas on our, on our roofs to more mobile applications, we're all carry, carrying around uh, in our pockets uh, these powerful personal computers and, and these information terminals, I call them. Uh, you know, our cell phones are really an access to the world of information for us. Uh, so it's all about mobility. It's all about um, more throughput, more data. Uh, we want speed, uh, both in um, uh, throughput and low latency. Uh, we want security. We want resiliency, especially uh, in the case of government application. Um, you want to think about a distributed architecture with multi-path, multi-node redundancy. Uh, and in the worst case, if something happens to one of these satellites, you want graceful degradation of the system, and you don't want to have uh, brownouts or blackouts uh, of the communication system. Um, and then as you, as you pointed out, Neil, this uh, 
what I like to call the global information grid versus the uh, internet 1.0 wanted to have a personal computer on every desk and connect the world and uh, have access to information. But now it's taking on a new life. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, beyond just telecommunication. It's earth observation, remote sensing. It's hyperspectral imaging. It's multi-domain, air, sea, uh, drones, dual use in commercial and government applications. <laughs> to, to quote uh, a, an Air Force general uh, from our Department of Defense, uh, he mentioned that uh, we, we are uh, swimming in sensors and drowning in data, <laughs> which is uh, aptly put. Uh, there's so much information that we also need to think about other things uh, like edge processing the information using uh, AI and machine learning so that we can only, so we only uh, transmit uh, the appropriate uh, data and uh, better utilize the, 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 this natural resource, this electromagnetic spectrum. So all of these are at play right now around us. And it requires, and all of these require one common technology, in my opinion, and, and that's active phase arrays and software-defined uh, payloads and radios and systems. And I think I should also highlight that you guys have also raised $29.2 million and are backed by some big names such as Airbus Ventures and Kleiner Perkins. So can you tell me more about that funding and, and also your relationship with these investors? Yeah, um, the relationship uh, is incredible. Uh, honestly, it's uh, far beyond uh, just the capital uh, that, that a startup needs, uh, which is really important. But the relationship uh, with our uh, VCs, uh, venture capital uh, firms, uh, has been great. Uh, it's uh, This is my uh, first uh, company, and uh, I have had the privilege of working with some amazing people. Uh, these are people that... Um, have built great companies, uh, right? Uh, they're not just source of funds, but uh, they're mentors and uh, uh, they're advisors, and uh, they have been an essential part of my company in its growth growth stage. So I'm 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 quite uh, honored to be working with uh, folks like uh, uh, Kleiner Perkins and uh, Airbus Ventures and others uh, that uh, have helped my company. And yes, uh, we've raised. Uh, this uh, initial uh, seed and Series A funding to to help us expand uh, and expand uh, the set of products uh, uh, that uh, we can offer. Uh, ulti- ultimately, we want to have a set of modular building blocks uh, that's, that span the frequencies from, uh, uh, let's say, gigahertz all the way up to maybe 50, 60 gigahertz and beyond. And these are Lego-like uh, building blocks that allow us to build very sophisticated payloads for all sorts of customers and satellites and drones and aircraft and airships uh, and all sorts of uh, other applications. And we, we, uh, we've we taken the, like I said, the bes- bespoke part of this, uh, where typically it required a lot of uh, various skills in, in uh, electrical engineering and mechanical engineering and aerospace engineering and made it into a product that you can uh, we, we, we sell to our customers with hardware and software uh, as a kit and, uh, and really lower the cost uh, and access uh, to this technology for our customers. And many of our customers really quite honestly care about their mission, uh, not the telecommunication part, not, not some of these. Uh, so, so we've taken that part and uh, uh, tried, to, tried to build an ecosystem around that, that, uh, that serves uh, uh, our customers. You mentioned customers there. Just for anyone listening that may be first to uh, to hear about you guys for, or hearing about you guys for the first time, who are your customers? Can you share a use case maybe just to bring to life everything that we're talking about here today for the listeners? Sure. I mean, um, you know, our customers are uh, commercial uh, companies uh, such as, you know, uh, Airbus, uh, you know, Honeywell and, uh, you know, Aris, traditional um um, providers of uh, satellite services. Um, we have uh, customers in the Department of Defense uh, for national security programs. Um, um, these, uh, you know, you know, programs that uh, provide telecommunication for um, uh, drones and other types of applications. Um, and uh, several examples I can give you. For example, uh, uh, you know. Providing telecommunication services uh, from a low Earth orbit satellite uh, 
require uh, steerable antennas, electronically steerable antennas, because these satellites are moving, uh, unlike the geostationary, where the rotational speed is locked uh, to the uh, to the Earth's uh, uh, rotational speed and the satellite uh, appears as stationary, uh, so you don't have to go on, on your roof and adjust your antenna. When you put satellites in the low Earth orbit, uh, they're moving, uh, they're completing an orbit, uh, let's say in about 90 minutes. And so the, the satellite uh, passes overhead uh, in a few minutes. So you have to sort of track the antenna. And similarly, the antenna has to um, steer the beam on Earth. So you need a steerable antennas. And uh, with these kind of systems, you're creating for a point-to-point -point communication, for example, you're creating lots of lots of cells, these uh, uh, small cells, uh, footprints, uh, kind of very similar to your uh, cellular technology uh, in our cities. You know, you, know, you, you, you have this uh, cellular infrastructure because you want to reuse the frequency as you uh, drive from one cell to the next cell. Your cell phone is changing the frequency without you knowing about it because, uh, because uh, you, you don't want to have one big cell covering the entire, let's say, London. You want to have lots of small cells so you can reuse the frequency. Same thing with... Uh, low Earth orbit satellites. You want to create lots and lots of beams, uh, lots of small cells, and you want to steer these cells so that you can maintain connection. And at the core of that uh, technology is our product. Active phase arrays allow you to uh, electronically steer the beam, both at the satellite and on the user terminal, to track each other and point the beam at each other. So you can uh, close the link, as we say, uh, and maintain that uh, connectivity. And then when the next satellite comes over, you want to hand off to the next satellite uh, without you knowing about it or without interruption to your service. So, the, so phase arrays do exactly that. And they do a bunch of other things. You can, uh, you can uh, uh, you know, route the power to the, to the cell that demands it the most. So if, uh, you, know, so if you have lots of uh, subscribers uh, and you want to assign more bandwidth to a particular cell or you want to provide more power, uh, then you, phase arrays allow you to um, do that very efficiently. And uh, so those are the, some of the applications. Some of the applications include, um, we have uh, uh, drones that want to connect to satellites. So we have aircraft connectivity. A lot of us fly on commercial aircraft that, and we want our internet and we want good internet on our flights. And, uh, and that market is headed towards uh, replacing mechanically steerable dishes that point to geosatellites to uh, phase, uh, you know, thin phased array satellites that are built into the skin of the aircraft and can track multiple low Earth orbit and geosatellites and provide much better connectivity. Um, uh, those are some of the examples of the customers that we have. And the company's full stack, multi-mission hardware and software products are decentralizing communications and rapidly forming the next generation of data infrastructure, which is sounds incredibly cool and exciting. But can you expand on that mission to both transform telecom and sensing industries, enabling that, that vision of a truly connected world that we often read about? But I'd love to hear how you're actually doing just that. Yeah, I think... Uh, I think, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we all want uh, more data. Uh, we, on, we all want, um, uh, you know, to me, uh, what excites me about this business is that, um, you know, access to knowledge, I've always believed access to knowledge is paramount uh, to advancement of the human condition. I think, I think that's the ultimate uh, goal is to uh, connect everything and have everyone around the world uh, have access uh, to this knowledge, to this uh, com common database uh, of the generations. And uh, I think connecting everything, connecting the entire globe, um, uh, connecting uh, our, ourselves, our devices, uh, providing uh, data uh, is going to improve our human condition. And uh, our technology allows us to efficiently welcome this next generation of global information grid and make it possible for low Earth orbit satellites. And like I said, drones and aircraft and um, autonomous driving in the future uh, uh, to have this, uh, to maintain this connectivity and to maintain this mobility and, uh, and speed and resiliency and all the things that I talked about. And, um, and so I see that, I see that future happening now. It's, it's quite a change. You know, people think of going from, 
you know, 2G to 3G to 4G and to 5G. And, you know, the, 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 the capabilities that uh, 5G systems uh, and beyond uh, bring about are incredible, uh, are really uh, uh, quite different than the uh, transformation from, let's say, 3G to 4G. I, I think... I think the change uh, from uh, you know the advent of 5G and beyond uh, is uh, much more dramatic uh, and and much more uh, impactful than uh, than the previous generations uh, of advancements in telecommunication. I think we're in for a uh, uh, for a, a true transformation of the telecommunication and and global sensing uh, around us. And um, I'm uh, very proud to be uh, part of this um, uh, transformation uh, with our technology. And with your latest funding, I also read that you're planning to launch two cube seats to, to prove your technology in space and expand a number of frequencies that you offer your customers. Again, sounds incredibly cool, but c- can you expand on that? Yes, yes. Thank you. Yes, that's uh, very exciting for us. Uh, you know, my, my background's, of course, with uh, building spacecraft and building uh, I know I spent uh, 24 years at Lockheed Martin building uh, uh, spacecraft. uh, And uh, I think, you know, being able to provide uh, this kind of technology and this hardware to to a number of customers uh, is is great and it's really cool. But we want to also have uh, uh, direct access uh, to end customers. Uh, These are the content providers and satellite operators. And and, uh, like I said, our Department of Defense and um, and uh, having our own platform uh, is really uh, important for us. Uh, and um, not only to initially demonstrate our technology, as we're doing this September with the launch of two of our satellites, two of our satellites, our own satellites will have our uh, K band. Uh, uh, these are roughly around uh, 24 to 29 gigahertz uh, frequency payloads on them. They have an inter satellite link, so the two satellites are connected and we can. Um, uplink and transfer the information from one satellite to the next and downlink the information. So we're demonstrating this technology plus some other uh, pending patents that we have around our technology in orbit this September. But beyond that, we want every year we want to launch more satellites and um, and expand uh, uh, our uh, capability and uh, perhaps uh, uh, provide um, uh, some services ourselves or, like I said, uh, provide the end item uh, product uh, to our customers. Um, and, and it won't stop with satellites. Uh, we have uh, plans to put our technology on drones and other uh, type of vehicles and uh, demonstrate our technology. So this funding allows us to, um, to really take this up uh, to the next level and uh, have a better vertical access uh, to our end customers. Such an incredibly cool story and a a journey that I'm going to be following on from the sidelines long after this podcast. And I'd love to get you back on later in the year, see how things are going. But more than anything, before I let you go, for anyone that wants to dig a little bit deeper on this and and find out more information or contact your team, what's the the best way of doing that? Yes, thank you, Neil. Uh, I think the best way to uh, connect with us right now is uh, through our website. Uh, uh, that's at cesiumastro.com, C-E-S-I-U-M-A-S-T-R-O, cesiumastro.com. Uh, there's a, a bunch of links out there uh, on that uh, website. You can connect with us, uh, connect with me. And uh, um, we have a dynamic team uh, of about uh, what 73 people now and are growing fast. And we'd be ha- happy to be in touch with you. Excellent. Well, I'll have those links to the blog post that will accompany this episode just so people can find you nice and easily. But I always say technology works best when it brings people together. And what I love about your story here is that mission to transform both the telecom and sensing industries and enabling a truly connected world. It doesn't get no better than that. So a big thank you, Shay, for sharing that story with me today. Neil, thank you very much. Uh, It's really my pleasure. and I appreciate your time today. The information industry is on the cusp of rapid change, which will be as dramatic as the initial adoption of the internet. And backed by Airbus Ventures, Kleiner Perkins and additional key investors, CCM Astro seems to be at the centre of this evolution with a configurable, adaptable product portfolio that extends the quality and cost 
of terrestrial data networking to new frontiers. So I cannot thank Shay enough for taking the time to come on here and share his story today. And also in other news, while I have your attention, I always ask every guest that's from Texas, where is the best barbecue so I can help plan a future trip? And so far, the answers I keep getting back are Franklin's and Rudy's. I want to throw that one over to you all listening in Texas. I know we have listeners in Texas, so help me gather my data so when all this craziness is over, I can pop over and sample for myself. And hey, maybe we can have a beer and a barbecue together. So if you have any questions, insights about anything we've talked about on today's episode, or you just have a nice Texas barbecue recommendation for me, send them over to techblogwriter at outlook.com. My website is techblogwriter.co.uk and you can get me on Twitter, LinkedIn, etc. just at Neil C. Hughes. So I will await your mouth-watering recommendations and <laughs> I'll wait for you here in your podcast tomorrow morning. But thanks for listening. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thank you for listening to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast with Neil C. Hughes. Remember, technology works best when it brings people together.